It's the sound of ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for joining us. It is back to school time for students and families, and students at Akron Public Schools return to class next week, Thursday the 29th. The teachers return the day before. Now, this is the second year for the district under the leadership of Dr. Michael Robinson, who accepted the role of superintendent in 2023. The district now is facing a budget shortfall, and some of the first decisions Dr. Robinson had to make in his tenure were those to cut back, including eliminating 285 staff positions, including more than 50 teachers. Nearly half of those cuts were made via attrition, including retirements and removing vacant positions. The district says its expenses are outpacing revenues and that an influx of money is needed. That's why voters will be asked to approve a combined bond and levy proposal in November. While many school districts will be implementing student cell phone bans this year, Akron has been way ahead on that front and has already seen results from its current policy. So here to talk about how Akron Public Schools is doing and how he is enjoying his role as superintendent, we have in studio from Akron, Dr. Michael Robinson in the studio. Welcome to The Sound of Ideas. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for making the drive. Absolutely. If you have a question for the superintendent or would like to make a thought, you can join the conversation, 866-578-0903, or you can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. So, Dr. Robinson, I wonder, how would you assess your first year at the helm of the district, and what will be the focus as you look towards this next year? Thank you so much for the question. Um, As I came into the district, um, as most people, um, superintendents know, your first year, even into your second year, Um, Those are years that you're doing a lot of observing, but in some cases, such as mine, um, there were a lot of decisions that had to be made um, in terms of um, budget um, issues and concerns, but we were able to successfully get through that. Uh, We did redistricting, restructuring. We had to go through that. Uh, So there were a lot of things that I was faced with uh, when I walked in the door. And so we were able to um, get through the budget shortfalls. Um, I think that we're going to have a great school year this year. We're planning uh, for that. Um, Our theme this year is Dream the Impossible. And certainly we're going to be doing that. Um, I, no matter what I face as superintendent, I stay focused on the children. It is so easy to get involved in adult issues, which those are important as well, the politics. um, But I stay focused on the children, my purpose, my why, and why I accepted the job, why I accepted the call to be a superintendent, uh, and why I accepted the call to be an educator. And so regardless to what I deal with and I face, I stay focused on the children. Um, Some adults may not feel that way, um, but I know in my heart that we're focusing on the children. And when you do that, then the decisions that I make are going to always be in the best interest of our scholars. What I didn't want to do was to touch, if possible, as much as I could, not touch the classroom. And so I think we were pretty successful in being able to do that. And so, um, you know, yes, there were some um, reductions with teachers, but I'm happy to say that um, all of those teachers that were on the list, except for about seven as of today, um, either accepted a job um, or some of them may have resigned, but the vast majority of those teachers were placed um, in in schools within our school district, so we were happy to be able to keep them. And, and it was not so much that we um, cut teachers per se, but we did have t- some who were working within our central office that were placed back in schools, which then pushed out, due to seniority, pushed out some of the brand new teachers, first and second, third year, fourth year teachers. So I'm happy to say that even in spite of all of that, 
we have been able to save um, jobs for our teachers. And so we have seven that are left on the list that we are still trying to uh, work with in terms of trying to place them. And I, I really believe before school starts um, next week, I think that we will have probably placed those teachers as well, if not all of them, the vast majority of them. Like I said, it's only seven that are left on the list. And that's mostly secondary when you get into specialization areas. So those are difficult decisions to have to make in your first year. I'm sure you had any anticipation of what was to come when you applied for the job or when they sought you out and um, knew what was coming. Um, but it sounds to me like you're saying the composition of the classrooms, as far as the kids' perspective and, and the teachers around them, you were really trying to keep the same. Yes. That they weren't losing teachers in the classroom and things of that nature. Is that yes. Am I understanding yes. that right? That is correct. Um, I was a classroom teacher, but I'm always going to be a teacher. Uh, I've been a school level at b building administrator, a turnaround administrator, uh, always going to have that hat on. So when I'm making decisions, my kids, my scholars are first um, and our employees, which includes our teachers, but all employees um, are, on, are, are on my mind when I'm making those decisions. Um, and, and what people also don't understand is that as an urban school district, as an urban superintendent, um, our issues are far different than sometimes that of our counterparts that are in suburban areas around us. And Akron is an urban school district. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and the, a lot of great things in spite of um, the the things that we've had to do and 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 everybody had to endure uh, budget shortfalls across the United States. Everyone is coming off of what we call the Esser Cliff, which was the money that was provided to school districts across the United States through our federal government via our state. Um, and so everybody has had to do what I've had to do. Uh, but coming into the job. Um, I didn't know specifically what I would be facing, um, but I, I knew, as I said to the board, um, if your district is like any other in the United States, if I'm selected as the superintendent, which I thank the board for allowing me the opportunity to have been selected, but if I was the one that was going to be selected, I knew that I would be coming into what I had to face. I didn't know all the intimate details of it, and so there were things that Obviously, I had to learn quickly some things I discovered quickly, um, but I'm happy to say that we have made it through that and we're ready to open our doors on uh, Monday for our teachers and on the 29th for our scholars. So you say kids are paramount to, to your job and your approach when it comes to how you want to run a school district. Um, I was education reporter here during the pandemic, and I know how hard hit Akron public schools and a lot of the uh, urban schools were particularly uh, hit by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, kids weren't going to school um, and, and academics plummeted. And I wonder um, what you're seeing now as far as academic performance and attendance, and if it's something that uh, the school district is actively working to address. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, attendance, um, I think that a lot of our urban districts across the United States deal with attendance issues. Um, we are certainly not where I want us to be, but I'm, I'm proud of the efforts and the work that our school leaders and our teachers and our central office staff did even before I got here. But in the first year that I've been here, there's been a lot of effort to implement PBIS. Um, and what's which, that stand for? Uh, positive Behavior Intervention Strategies that um, uh, so many of our scholars deal with life issues issues that some of us as, as adults cannot even fathom. But when you're working in urban school districts, there are times when some of our scholars are at grandmama's house one night, they might be at a, uh, an aunt's house the next. Th sure. that's, that's just the nature of the work that we have to deal with. And so sometimes they don't have the resources and the means to be able to 
just wash clothes. Something so simple as just having their clothes washed. Sometimes grandmama has to go to the laundromat, you know, or a family member has to, they have to wash things. I'm not saying that every child in our school district faces that. But a large majority of our children do face those types of issues, and they impact their attendance. So having PBIS to be implemented, which is a part of our uh, move around MTSS, which is multi-tiered systems of supports, um, that's why I'm so passionate about the MTSS model, because it is not just about rewarding children for coming to school or rewarding them for things, but it's also looking at the whole child, looking at them academically, looking at them so socially, emotionally, looking at their uh, them and, and when it comes to behavior, um, looking at the entire child sure. and making sure that we're providing resources. There are schools within our district where um, teachers, administrators, actually help families. Um, we're thankful for the work that has been done in collaboration uh, with United Way, who has been a huge partner with us through our family uh, resource centers, where they work with us and work with our families to help them, whether it's job, you know, finding jobs or, or, or having an access to computers to be able to look for jobs, providing them with food, and even outside of that, many of our schools uh, have food banks within those schools. Um, and so a lot of our kids go home on Fridays with backpacks with food in it um, to help them get through the, through the weekend. When you are working in urban school districts, mm -hmm. these are some of the challenges that we face. And so it does impact our attendance rates. But we're, we're, we're doing some great things in terms of improving our attendance rates. I'd like for us to get to a realistic number of about 96%. Um, but we aren't there yet. But I just believe that through time, we're going to get there. The more that kids enjoy school and want to be in school, they're going to come. They're going to make an effort to come. And so one of the things that I'm going to be doing, even though school is getting ready to open, but I'm still going to be going and visiting uh, families within our neighborhoods, knocking on doors, just just welcoming, welcoming our scholars back to school, our families back to school. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be doing a very huge concerted effort to get our PTAs up and running in all of our schools. Some of our schools don't have it. Some of them have a PTSO or a PTO. We want all of our schools to have a PTA uh, where we will be able to get that support through our state PT, you know, local and as well as state PTA uh, support to help get our families into the schools and engage them. Many times in urban school districts, um, people say, well, the, fa the families are not involved. They are involved, but they cannot come to school every time we call them. They can't come for every activity, but they are involved in other ways that help support that. So that's important when it comes to the attendance, when it comes to the academic performance. I am pleased that the, in spite of everything that we had to deal with this, this past school year, uh, as our data is going to uh, be eventually made public, what because right now it's an embargo, uh, but what I do know is that our teachers and our school leaders, our families worked very hard and it is going to show in the data. It may not be where some people think it should be, but I'm just happy to see the growth. Um, for example, in Algebra two, uh, Algebra one, we made double digit gains there. Um, so, and there are other uh, aspects. If you look at our Blueprint for Excellence, which is our strategic plan, um, I'm proud of the work that that was done with that as well, so that we could derive at what we call KPIs, our key performance indicators. All of that helped us in having a goal and a focus. And so our teachers work very hard, our paraprofessionals, 
our cafeteria workers, our secretaries, everyone, our school leaders worked very hard. Uh, We did a lot around family and community engagement. In fact, just last night and again tonight, um, we're going to be a backpack for the at the zoo where our families can come. They can register. Uh, we welcome people in our community if they want to come back to Akron Public Schools, which we welcome them to do so. We we actually had families last night that actually uh, came back to Akron Public Schools. So Akron Public Schools is doing a lot to we have our college and career academies where we we're actually now taking it down to the elementary schools, uh, even in our pre-K, which we, this year we were able to expand. And so when you ask me about uh, academics, it's important for our children to have full day pre-K, which thankful to our board for allowing me to be able to step out on that. We're going to be this year, and in fact, we have a waiting list uh, for full-time slots. We still have some part-time slots, half-time slots that are open, but literacy has to be at the forefront of everything we do, especially in an urban school district. You're looking at someone, even though my mother was a teacher and I came from what would be considered a middle class family at that time, but when I think back and really look at where we were as a family, we were one step above poverty looking at where my family was and how much money my mom you know, made as a school teacher back in those days. but. Literacy has to be at the forefront. It's it's personal with me because I was a non-reader. And so a comp- because comprehension was an issue for me, I didn't learn to really read until I got into high school. Mm. Teachers helped me along the way. And it's not because my mother didn't do her job because she had me in every summer program that there sure. was. Wow. But when children, especially children in an urban school district, do not have early exposure, and that's what we're doing through our full day pre-K this year, that's important. I also think about the, af- the, the aftermath of COVID. Those scholars that are going to be in fourth grade or fifth grade this year, um, they suffered tremendously sure. because they missed out on kindergarten, and in most cases, a a large percentage of their first grade year where that's where the foundational skills are taught, right? Those kids, so we're paying very close attention. I am personally paying close attention to the performance of those fourth graders and those fifth graders and making sure that we do not let those kids slip through the cracks because especially knowing that they were the kids that were greatly impacted by COVID. I want to make sure that they're very successful. Let me ask you this. There's been a lot of focus on the district's efforts to right-size itself Mm -hmm. and how that is a means to a better end when it comes to teaching the kids in the classroom. So how has this impacted students and families? Well, it, it the fam our families and students are not that again when we are doing this restructuring and re- right sizing, I don't want them to feel anything. I don't want them to feel a loss of services and supports and resources. So, although these things are happening around them, they are not going to feel that impact because I didn't want that to be something that would impact them. We can still do what we need to do and not impact our families, at least for this year, for sure. Um, You know, budgetarily, I'm trying to make sure that the resources are still provided to our schools. We may not be able to do all of the things that we were doing before in terms of resources, but we're doing the things that we need to be able to do and making sure that they still have those supports and resources in the classroom. We did have some tutors that uh, we had full day, full time tutors. We also had some part time tutors. Uh, We had to reduce in terms of some of our part time tutors, but we're actually able to see where we're going to be able to maybe afford to maybe increase, not by much, but But by a little, we were able to get some additional federal funding. So we're trying to make sure that we use that wisely 
and making sure that our kids have the extra supports during the day in reference to our tutors. So we were able to add on a few more this year than what we thought we would be able to do. So we have openings for those opportunities as, as well. But one thing that I don't want is I don't want our families, I don't want our kids feeling any of this restructuring. Now they might feel it in the sense that the teacher that they may have had last year may not be the teacher that they're gonna have this year, but at least they're going to have hopefully a certified teacher in the classroom um, who is able to provide the instruction that, that is going to be needed. More on these hard decisions that have been made. The District Board of Education voted to close three school buildings last year, although two might be used for preschool. Um, and the district generally, over the last several decades, has closed 20 school buildings. Uh, are there more closures on the way? And, and, and how do you make the case for these changes? Right now, forecasting ahead for next school year. I know we are we haven't opened the new school year yet, but just forecasting for the new school year, which will be 25-26. Um, there is nothing to my knowledge as of today. Now, things do change. Things are very fluid. But as of today, there is nothing in, on the horizon for any type of school closures or mergers um, for 25-26. Now, don't hold me to that because things happen, as that's what I mean about it being fluid. But as of today, and even though, you know, some people say, well, school hasn't opened and you're already talking about 25, 26, I have to, as a superintendent, be a year or two ahead of where we are. And so what I can say today, there is nothing on the horizon for any type of school closures. The ones that happened this year, uh, much of that was already in, a, in, in effect before I ever even was interviewed or accepted the job. And so uh, once I got in here to the position and then realized that there were some closures and mergers that were on the horizon, uh, we quickly act on, acted on that, made sure that our families, we kept them abreast. I went out into the community, met with families, received feedback from them. Um, much of that feedback we were able to actually take back to my team um, and we were able actually to make some changes in even how we were going to do certain things. Um, but one thing I do is I try to listen to what our families have to say as we're making decisions. Um, it's not always easy and it's not always easy to explain to them when I can't or why I can't. But I, I try to be as transparent as I can um, in keeping them abreast as to, as to what's going on. We have Dr. Ma Michael Robinson in the studio. He is the superintendent of Akron Public Schools. If uh, any of our listeners want to ask a question or give a thought, you're uh, welcome to join in the conversation, 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org or tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Now, I want to ask you about your relationship with the Teachers Union. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been uh, accusations of, of your union busting on several occasions. Uh, over the summer, uh, there were, you know, there were accusations made that the district is rehiring teachers. It had fired into new non-union positions. What would you say to that? Well, we didn't fire any teachers um, and we're not union busting. Um, and certainly um, it, it it is very disappointing, I think, that uh, people have created obstacles where there really didn't need to be any. Um, and I don't, one thing I'm not going to do in public, um, I don't get into uh, name calling or criticizing people or talking about people, but what this, the, our district has gone through, I am probably the fourth or fifth superintendent, I think I'm the fourth superintendent in about five or six years. Um, and so I think that there has been a common denominator in all of those relationships. And so I certainly want to work well with all of our teachers, um, without all of our unions, not specifically just our teachers union, but with all of our, t our unions. Um, I am a teacher first before I'm anything. And so it's important 
for me to have that working relationship, um, you know, with our union leaders. Um, and I try to uh, be very transparent with them. Um, yes, people people can say whatever they want to say, right? I, I can't stop people from saying what they want to say. I also can't stop people from having their own perceptions. I have a perception too. Um, but what I don't do is I don't spend time through media um, going after or attacking. Um, I'm very quiet and, and, and subtle in how I move and react to things. Um, sometimes People might say, well, aren't you going to respond back? to?" No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Because you know why? I'm the leader. And I'm the one that our scholars are looking up to and looking at. Our families are looking up to me and they're looking at me. And so it's important for me to always maintain professionalism and how I in deal with people uh, how I uh, build relationships with people. And so I don't spend my time focusing on the sure. negative. I spend my time focusing on the opportunities. And so in working with our unions, um, there have been many things said. I've sat and listened to some of the things and not even understood where it came from or or what they meant or listening to them say things and the facts are not actually correct. Um, and so when you're sitting there listening sometimes to these things and then the aftermath of some of this, when you go back and you and and when you do discover what was meant by that and it's like that's not at all the case or exactly the facts of that. Uh, so I'm 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 very very methodical and very careful in that I do not get in public and go back and forth. I don't do that. Do so let I, me do, let me ask you this mm -hmm. then. I mean, it's clear you don't want to step into some sort of argument about um, past actions, but I mean, obviously, a, a good relationship needs to be had with, with all the unions. Absolutely. And, and what is your um, intent and hope uh, in in having a dialogue and working with the teachers? Union I'm going to going continue. Forward? I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. I meet with my union leaders every month. Those that are able to attend, um, my door is always open to all of our union leaders. They have my personal number, so they can call me, and some of them do, uh, on a frequent basis, <laughs> um, which I have no problems with. I welcome that. Uh, they know that I'm available day, night, weekends, and some of them call me. So uh, the structure that we have, we do have a labor relations uh, department, and we do have a human capital department where our labor union leaders uh, we'll interface more with them. However, I'm meeting with my labor uh, department and human capital department. I meet with them almost daily. So I am very well abreast as to what is going on um, and when it is necessary for me to, to engage along with them, with our union leaders, uh, I do so. And so I'm a very approachable person. People, again, have their own perception Sure. And they can create their own narratives. Uh, but in the end, um, see, at the end of the day, this work for me is ministry work, right? This is a calling for me because I can remember times when I try to find something else to do and get out of education. Uh, and I always found myself right back where I started from because I know that this is what it was divinely orchestrated for my life. And so I'm here because I want to be here. I'm here because I want to see longevity in this in this role and do the work. And I'm here to build those relationships that need to happen, whether it's with our business community, whether it's with our family, uh, employees, with our labor unions. And I'm going to continue to keep doing what I can. I can only build relationships where and when people allow that to happen. All right, we have a handful of minutes left. I, I want to ask you about this combined operating levy and bond issue to rebuild North High School this November. Um, how is this request landing, and what was the rationale to have them combined uh, on the ballot? 
Well, um, I'm not really, due to the state law, I'm not really able to really get into levy issues, but I can speak about the facts. Yeah, let's hear them. And so the fact of the matter is uh, Akron Public Schools, finan- fiscally, we need a levy. Mm-hmm. Um, however, uh, this actually was supposed to happen in 2019, but of course we know, unfortunately, COVID hit. Uh, there was supposed to be a reduction in staff and budget budget cuts and, and all of those types of things happening in 2019 and in 2020. But again, due to COVID, um, that did not occur. And so, unfortunately, those things had to stretch as long as they did. And we're at a point where we can't go anymore. We've It has been 12 years mm. since the district has had a levy. Um, that's not really to be... What, what is to be commended is that the district uh, really and truly managed the finances and in order to help us survive. COVID happening, even as, even as egregious as that was for us across the United States, it probably slowed some things down for us uh, as a district. But we're now at a point in time when we cannot continue to, to keep going on. Um, and so a levy being combined will help us with operating expenses. It will also help us to build North High School. Uh, there were some conversations, you know, of, of course, prior to my arrival that, you know, why didn't we do North first and then the other schools? Well, I wasn't here and it, and, and what is happening is happening. So it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us to even discuss the why in that. Sure. What is important is that we want our families to know that we are trying our best not to have to do any type of further cuts. We don't want to have to do any more, you know, further cuts. In some, and in some cases, we're very, very ad- extra lean um, in some compartments of our school district. Um, and, and and a district this size, we shouldn't have to be as lean as we are in certain areas, that is. And then when it comes to the classroom, you know, I really don't want to take away things from our kids. I don't want to take away you know, extracurricular activities or have to have to shave here and shave there um, with summer programming and all those types of things. So we need a levy. We are we are a district right now that um, needs the levy. But what I can assure you is that in four, I'm, I'm sorry, in about five to six years and thereafter on a continuous basis, we will have to come back and continue to keep doing a levy because we cannot afford to go 12 years again. And and it is my hope, it is my prayer that this levy, and I'm going to believe that it's going to pass in November, but thereafter, we will need to still be planning in five or six years to do another levy for operating expenses, to be able to maintain our beautiful schools that were built Prior to my arrival, now we are building two uh, new schools this year, Miller South and Piper, which was already in the in the motion before I came. Um, and then, of course, we would be needing to build north. So the hope, my prayer is that this levy and I'm believing that it will pass in November and then we will be able to build North High School, which desperately needs to be rebuilt. All right. I want to ask you about the cell phone ban in middle and high schools. It was a subject that we were excited to talk about here on our show. We had a full panel on it. And uh, it it was a novel at the time for a a district to be saying, you know, you got to put your phones in a bag and you can't have them. How have those efforts um, uh, have you found that they have been positive in affecting the students' attention and in alleviating uh, the situations when it comes to fights and those types of things? Yes, 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 it has. Um, you were speaking about our teachers' union, but um, there was a great 
um, move last last well yeah last year the end of last the year before sure. not last year there was a great move on the part of our unions especially our teachers union working in collaboration with uh, our uh, administration at the time I was not here uh, but I walked into the implementation phase of much of this and happy to say that it it, it was extremely successful did, was it perfect? Absolutely not. Um, I only can recall of only one situation this past year, a uh, two, I'm sorry, uh, this past year where um, a child did not have their phone or their bag broke and they were able to do, but that was only one situation. And actually the other situation was actually after school. So I guess that one doesn't count. We, we won't count um, that one. Yeah, that one doesn't count. So, but there was only one situation this past year. Uh, teachers, from what I have heard from teachers in speaking with them personally, that is not every teacher in the sure, district, but as I go into buildings and talk with teachers, talk with school leaders, talk with our paraprofessionals, I even talk with our custodians as well uh, when I go into schools and just asking them questions. You know, it's not about a gotcha, but it is about how is what we're doing working and mm -hmm. how, you know, what can we do to make it better? And they have been very pleased with having the yonder bags uh, and having those phones. Now, our kids, on the other hand, sure. <laughs> weren't necessarily happy. But, you know, I did talk to some kids. I have a, a scholar advisory committee and there was some mixed emotions there. Some were in favor, some were not. But in talking with children as I go into the building, some of the kids actually said, well, you know, it's not so bad after all. I, I, I talk more with my friends. Uh, I pay more attention in class. I'm not on my phone. Now, some parents, you know, said, well, how am I supposed to get in touch with my child? Call the school. The school will n get your child to the phone. If it's an emergency, we will get that child to the phone immediately. Uh, so make sure that the families have communication with their child. I know that anything new that you try, sometimes people don't see the value in it until later. And I think we're starting to see that value now with a lot of our families. But it really and truly the efforts that they made along with our teachers union, all of our unions, actually, but our teachers union, which was very instrumental in that um, with Mrs. Scheip, uh, part of that. And along with our our school leadership uh, system leadership, they um, we presented at Ohio eight when I first came in last year. And they were very instrumental in getting the yonder bags here, yeah. the, um, the the bag scanners, sure. um, the metal detectors, and we have state of the art. And I and I'm grateful um, because our district did use our ESSER funds in the proper way. Uh, I'm grateful that we have those funds that could help us with with this at the time that it happened. And so it's very important for us to continue this. This year, we're going to be implementing the Raptor system, which is going to be an addition to to that. So we are really trying to move forward to keep our schools safe. I know some people had their own opinion about our schools, but our schools are extremely safe. Good. Uh, the environments are wholesome for learning and for children to come back to school and to welcome those who are sitting on the fence. We welcome them to come on back to Akron Public Schools. Well, Dr. Robinson, unfortunately, we have run out of time, but I appreciate you Thank again you. for your willingness to come in and to talk to us and our listeners. Dr. Michael Robinson, Superintendent of Akron Public Schools. Thank you so much. And absolutely. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Time now for a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the legal challenge filed over ballot language approved for the anti-gerrymandering issue before voters this November. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. You're with the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for staying with us this hour. The coalition that worked to put an anti-gerrymandering amendment on the November ballot has filed suit against the Ohio ballot board. Citizens, not politicians, wants the Ohio Supreme Court to force the ballot board to rewrite the ballot summary language for the issue. This is the language that voters see when they are deciding whether to vote for the issue or not. 
the amendment which seeks to take politicians out of the redistricting process and making Ohio's political district maps will appear as issue one on the November ballot. The Ohio Ballot Board approved summary language drafted by Secretary of State Frank LaRose. It's nearly 900 words long, but the length LaRose says was needed to due to the complexity of the issue. An attorney for citizens, not politicians, has called the summary language as a, quote, farce of Shakespearean proportions. Joining me now to talk about the lawsuit and what led up to its state house is State House News Bureau Chief Excuse me, reporter Joe Ingalls. Joe, I'm giving you a promotion. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not going to take Karen's job because she's, she's, she's Karen is Karen. We love her. Just leave her like she is. That's right. So. <laughs> well, Joe, yeah. so, so glad to have you. It's been a while. So uh, glad to have you on. Thank you. And if you'd like to join the conversation, call 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. So, it, Joe, it seems like this saga continues and continues with twists and turns that, that might not be anticipated the week before. So let's talk about this new language that was drafted by Secretary of State Frank LaRose and why it is being so um, sharply reacted to by proponents of Issue 1. Right, right. Well, uh, this new language is very different than the actual language in the amendment. And uh, if you listen to, it was a very, this lawsuit that they just filed was very expected because on Friday, after the board approved this language, the um, people with citizens, not politicians, said, we're filing a lawsuit. That's it. We're, we're done. And so uh, they filed it uh, Monday and it came as absolutely no surprise. So let me ask you this, Joe. I mean, what if you were kind of to explain to our listeners what is so in their eyes offensive about how this uh, ballot language is being offered up? Um, what how would they describe it? I mean, y- we said it as a farce of Shakespearean proportions. But my 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 impression is that it's really confusing. It well redistricting period is really confusing. Um, but Don McTighe, who is the attorney for citizens, not politicians, said the language approved by the ballot board, um, and these are his words, may be the most biased, inaccurate, deceptive, and unconstitutional ballot language ever adopted by the Ohio ballot board. Now, he says that the ballot board's language would repeal constitutional protections against gerrymandering. That's the way it, it's worded in there. And would would eliminate the longstanding ability of Ohio citizens to hold their representatives accountable for establishing fair state legislative districts. But actually, um, you know, what what this is meant to do is the opposite. It's meant to take gerrymandering out of the process, and it is meant to give voters a better shot of holding their politicians accountable. Yeah, it's interesting because even, Joe, the title of the issue, uh, it reads, Issue 1, to create a redistricting commission not elected by or subject to removal by voters of the state. So the very spirit of the title makes it seem like voters don't have a say or control if they vote to support this. And that's really not true because there is a part of it where uh, the people who are put on this uh, commission can be challenged. Um, there's there's a lot more that goes into it than you see in that summary. Uh, citizens, not politicians, had proposed a summary of their own, and it was just about a paragraph long. But, you know, a summary is not meant to be a substitute for reading an actual amendment. And what we saw, if you take the, the cue from November, what we saw was a summary that didn't exactly say what the amendment did. And the group behind that amendment kept saying, read the amendment and putting it out in front of people. And people were very confused about it. And uh, they saw that it didn't match. So I think we can see that coming in this campaign as well. Susan from Willowick wrote in and said, I want to thank all the people who collected signatures and 
Marina Connor, referring to uh, Ohio Chief Justice uh, Marina O'Connor, uh, for her efforts to get this amendment passed and to sue to have fair language on the ballot in November. Do we know if 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 the former Supreme Court justice has made any comments regarding this this ballot language? Oh, yes, she has. Uh, she has said, you know, she's been right there with uh, Dominic Tig on this. She said it is not fair. It's political. And uh, she's just she's kind of just had it with the language. So she's uh, also behind this lawsuit wanting it to go and, and get fixed. Um, but, you know, here's the other thing. Uh, look at the Ohio Supreme Court when they rejected the current maps that we have. The Ohio Supreme Court rejected those seven different times as unconstitutional. And Maureen O'Connor was the chief justice back then. She's a Republican, was the chief justice, but she sided with the Democrats on that. So now she's not there. You've got a four to three Republican majority, and it is widely thought that that Republican majority on the Supreme Court might be more likely to allow um, the Republican proposed languages to stand. So is that kind of how you're seeing it as a reporter that uh, this will work its way um, to the Supreme Court and that is how the ruling might bear, bear out is on political lines? I think that that's very likely. I mean, if we look at, you know, how things are, you know, it's the Supreme Court has it filed right now. If we look at how things could could go, um, we saw last year that there was um, basically a tweak in the language, but not anything that was a big change in the, the and that was the November Amendment language. Um, who knows what they're going to say about this language. They might make tweaks, but you know, the tone, as you pointed out earlier, Jenny, the tone is different in the summary than it is in the amendment. So uh, I think you're going, you're just going to see the citizens, not politicians folks saying, Hey, what you see on your ballot, don't take that is what it is, you know, go read the amendment and you're going to have people who are going to notice a difference in the way things are worded and the way things are presented. Yeah. So then what's the workaround for those who feel that, like you said, the ballot language is, you know, almost contrary to the spirit of the amendment? I mean, do you talk to every Ohio voter in the state and say, here's the real deal when you go to vote on issue one? Well, I think that's what they did with the abortion amendment. And and since 57 percent of Ohioans who voted passed that amendment, it must have worked somehow there. Um, They also set up the member, the read the amendment uh, website that they set up where they were directing traffic to the actual amendment and people were reading it. Um, And I think, you know, we've got to remember that Citizens Not Politicians is pretty well funded. They're not going into this with absolutely zero money in their pocket. And they have already purchased ad space. It's already purchased. It's already done. So they're going to have the ability to get their message out with paid media. So, Joe, I think what's interesting, I didn't know this, but the Ohio Ballot Board already had a legal challenge to summary language it approved. It happened last year for the abortion access Mm -hmm. amendment. Um, So what was the final results of that? It was just tweaking it. It wasn't making substantial changes. And that's the reason a lot of people who are watching this think that maybe the court will not, you know, wholesale say, oh, this is bad. We're not going to let you have this. You've got to completely rewrite it. Um, the court might be more uh, likely to say, you've got to make some changes. Um, you've got to change this wording and that wording or whatever. We don't know what the court will say. It's all a guess right now. But based on what w- what happened last fall, um, there, you know, I don't think that the citizens, not politicians, people are expecting something to be rewritten in their favor. So then I guess a- another question that maybe well, that I have, um, but I'm wondering if listeners might have, is can there be changes made to the actual amendment itself? Or if it goes through, despite all the confusion, uh, will the spirit of the amendment as written by citizens, not politicians, be carried out? 
They cannot change the amendment itself. It's already gone through the process of going, you know, an amendment has to jump through so many hoops through the attorney general. It's already been through the, um, uh, you know, ballot board once. It's, it's, it, there's like a whole process. And if they were to change anything, they'd have to go back through that process, which means they wouldn't oh. be able to get it on this November's ballot. So uh, it will not have changes. And I think what we're going to see is they're going to focus, the citizens, not politicians folks, are going to focus on areas of misunderstanding and confusion among voters. Statehouse News Bureau reporter Joe Ingalls, I know you will be watching this with an eagle eye and reporting back to us. So I I thank you for joining us and, and bringing us up to date on this issue. Thank you for having me, Jenny. Thanks, Joe. You can hear Joe's reporting and the rest of the State House team daily on 89.7 WKSU and online at ideastream.org. Now, to get the last word on today's topics, you can always send an email to soi at ideastream.org. We're on Twitter now, X at Sound of Ideas. And you can follow me at Jenny Hamill underscore or on Instagram at Jenny Hamill Idea Stream. Tomorrow on the Sound of Ideas, we will get another update on the Democratic National Convention underway in Chicago. We'll talk about the impact the change at the top of the ticket has had on the presidential rates and down ballot, too. If you miss any portion of the program, you can find us online or listen to the Sound of Ideas podcast. Just a reminder, there will not be a rebroadcast of our program tonight at 9 because NPR is providing special coverage of the Democratic National Convention from 9 to 11 tonight, which you can hear on 89.7 WKSU. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for listening. I'll speak with you tomorrow.